Colossians chapter 3. And I'm going to pick up at verse number 7. I want to talk a little bit about our past walk and our present witness. The way it used to be and the way it is supposed to be. The way it used to be and the way it can be. The way it used to be and the way it ought to be. And ought in the sense that the Lord Jesus Christ, through the provision of God the Holy Spirit, makes provision for us to live above reproach. We can live differently. Oh, Johnny Hall years ago gave me some um, volumes by George Whitfield. When I read about Apollos in the New Testament, I think about George Whitfield. From everything I've read about Whitfield, he was a powerful, powerful preacher of the gospel. And uh, I, I, I've been reading this Standing Firm devotional for a couple of years. I know I drive y'all crazy with devotional books because I read so many. I read about five at a time. And sometimes I read them two or three years because they're just so deep and to the point. But uh, this one was entitled, Beware of Backsliding. You ever backslid before? You ever backslid in your heart? You ever backslid in your attitude? You ever backslid in your actions? I mean, man, the list goes on and on and on. And while you're trying to decide if you have or not, I'll vote. You know, sign me up. I flat have. But you need to beware of backsliding. I want you to hear what Whitfield said because sometimes uh, I had some guys that emailed me recently. I was preaching one Sunday, and I guess I got beside myself, and I made this statement. I said, I feel like a dinosaur in the 21st century. And what I meant by that is I feel like an old-fashioned preacher. I feel like where are the preachers? And I know, just like Elijah, there's thousands that have not bowed their knee. But, but there, there's not as much. In the contemporary church today, it seems to be more about whether I connect with you and whether I'm cool and whether I say it just right. Instead, and then I, 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 I miss a lot of passion these days. I mean, where somebody not only got into the Word of God, but the Word of God got into them. Not only they get hold of a message, but the message got hold of them. I'm of the deep conviction if it don't do something to me when I'm preparing, it probably won't do anything to you when I'm presenting. So it just matters. But whatever now that I'll pick up a book, and, and sure enough, back in the 1700s, somebody said something, and I think, I feel just like they did. And like I say, I know there's more out there than I, I'm aware of, but I, this just spoke to where I, I am, and I want to read this and give the text and go as far as I can, and if I live, I'll pick up next week where I left off, and when I die, when you get to heaven, I'll pick up where I left off. <laughs> he said, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but if you cannot fall finally, you may fall foully. He said, you may go with broken bones all your days. Take care of backslidings for Jesus Christ's sake. Do not grieve the Holy Ghost. You may never recover your comfort while you live. Boy, not a good word. You may recover, but you may never recover your comfort while you live. And then George Whitfield said, I paid dearly for backsliding. Haven't we all? Our hearts are so cursedly wicked that if you take not care, if you do not keep up a constant watch, your wicked hearts will deceive you and draw you aside. It will be sad to be under the scourge of a correcting father. Let me therefore exhort you that have got peace to keep a close walk with Christ. I am grieved with the loose walk of those that are Christians. How many times did I say it on the week before Easter that there's too little difference between the unsaved and the saved. And, and Whitfield calls it the loose walk of those that are Christians that have had discoveries of Jesus Christ. There's so little difference between them and other people that, that I scarce know which is the true Christian. Christians are afraid to speak of God. They run down with the stream. And if they come into worldly company, they will talk of the world as if they were in their element. This you would not do when you had the first discoveries of Christ's love. Uh, you could talk then of Christ's love forever when the candle of the Lord shined upon your soul. 
Stand with me for the reading of the word of God. In verse number 7, after just naming the sensual sins of the flesh and talking about the wrath of God coming upon the sons of disobedience, in verse 7, Paul said, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now you yourselves are put off, are to put off all these. And listen to what he names. Put off anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, uh, filthy language out of your mouth. There's a good word. Sometimes someone says, well, I didn't take God's name in vain. You're not supposed to talk dirty. You're not supposed to use dirty language. These four-letter words or ever how many letters are in them. You clean your act up and you can't do it in your own strength. I'm going to show you that in just a moment. The Bible says in verse 9, do not lie to one another. Isn't that amazing? He just named one, two, three, four. He named five sins, what we call social sins, and then he separated them because he wanted to put more importance on one. And he said, do not lie. And in the Greek t uh, text, it's a present tense verb. It says, stop lying. Almost with an exclamation mark. Stop your lying. That's how it's translated. Stop your lying. Uh, Christians aren't supposed to lie. Your word is your honor. If you say you'll do it, do it. If you owe it, pay it. Stop your lying. Since you have put off the old man with his deeds. In Jesus' name, speak to our hearts for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. Our past walk and our present witness. Pastor, get honest with us. In your own life, does your past walk every now and then just kind of show itself? Some of the old habits of the old way have a way of rising back up? Yes. Yeah, they do. Boy, I lost my temper this week. Ugh. Felt so bad afterwards. Repented and asked my wife to forgive me. The old anger rising up. It'd be easy to say, yeah, we hunts have a temper. No, I've got Jesus living in me. I have no excuse. Are y'all listening? Yeah. yeah, we come from a long line of the Irish, and they all had tempers. Yeah, but did they ever meet the Holy Ghost? Because the Lord Jesus Christ can end all of your excuses and help you to be an overcomer. And I really believe that in the Christian life, that's what we passionately desire, is to live a life that would rebound to the glory of God so that when we breathe our last breath and know we step into the presence of Jesus, that we've lived a life that would bring glory to God. I believe that the apostle Peter would have seconded Paul's motion to discard our past walk. Those things of the past ought to be taken off like a soiled garment. Uh, they're the deeds of the flesh. Yes, the old man has died, but his ways and his deeds are still extremely memorable, and we're tempted every now and then to act like we used to act. It, it is true that the, the part you feed, whether you feed your flesh or your faith, one will be the prevailing factor in your life. That's just the truth. You need to starve the flesh and feed the faith so that you can be victorious, that you can be strong and an overcomer. The apostle Peter gave some of the most incredible words. It's written more like 21st century vernacular to our understanding. Listen to the words. In 1 Peter chapter 4, oh, Peter was talking about what Christ had done and how we ought to be different now, and he put it this way. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same mind. So, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh. I shouldn't live the rest of my time in the flesh, but in the faith uh, uh, for the lust of men. But I, should, I li should live the rest of my life for the will of God. For we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, the word would be likened unto the heathen. Now, would you not agree with this statement? Peter's taking an assessment of his life, and he said, you know what, if I don't live another day as long as I live in the context of appeasing the flesh, I I've lived enough time there already. I ought to live the rest of my life in the will of God. Hey, wouldn't this be an incredible day today that the major number of decisions that would be Christians that would say, you know what, I I've, I've allowed the dictate of the flesh to have enough rule and domain in my life. By the grace of God, I want to live the rest of my life in the will of God. And I will tell you, you can't live in the will of God without living a life of obedience. 
spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. And, and then he names what that was like when we walked in lewdness and lust and drunkenness and revelers, uh, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. In regard to these, they, that is our old friends, think it's strange that you do not run with them anymore. And by the way, listen to me. You shouldn't run with them anymore. That's the indication of the text. You shouldn't run with the old crowd anymore. Yes, go there, be a witness for them, but you don't run with the old crowd. When God saved me out of the pool room, I went back to the pool room and was a great witness in that pool room, but I didn't run with that crowd anymore. Guess what? Many of them run with me today. You have to make your mind up whether you're going to run with the old crowd or you're going to try to bring that crowd up to run with you. The Bible says they think it's strange that you not run with them in this flood of dissipation. Dissipation means wastefulness. And so what they do, they speak evil of you. Do you understand what that means? Did you hear what that says? They speak evil of you. In other words, when you try to be the Christian God wants you to be and you won't run and live the way you used to, that crowd will talk about you. And can I say something to you? They ought to be talking about you. They don't understand this new life. Your life is hid with Christ in God. And they can't understand it, the Bible teaches in John chapter 16. So in Colossians 3, Paul uses an imagery of clothing, reminding us that before the garments of righteousness can be put on, the old rags of sin must be discarded. Now, the verb put off, you see it there in your Bible? In verse number 8, put off, the Bible says, calls for decisive, immediate resolution. Aorist, middle, imperative. When the Bible uses a passive verb, like when the Bible says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, that's a passive verb. It means that you can't fill yourself. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit. God fills you with the Holy Spirit, so you can't fill yourself. But when the Bible says put off, it doesn't use a passive voice where another acts upon you. It uses a middle voice, which means you must cooperate with the one making the order. Does that make sense? It means that I've got to put it off. Occasionally somebody just says, well, if God doesn't want this in my life, I've just asked him to take it from me. He ain't going to take it from me and he didn't give it to you. But if you will cooperate with him, call it what God calls it, yield yourself to the Spirit of God, he will help you to put it off. Just as a runner is to lay aside, and by the way, the word lay aside in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 is the exact same Greek verb as put off every weight to run a successful race so the believer must put off the garments of sin in order to live the Christ-adorned life. That's what I want to do. I want to live a Christ-adorned life. One of my devotions the other day in Oswald Chambers was talking about the fact as you yield your life to God, people will begin to see more God in you. And I really desire that. I'm just talking to you out of my heart this morning. I want people to see more God in me. I really do. Less John, more God. Uh, John 3.30 is the key verse in the Bible that I must decrease and Jesus Christ must increase so to be less about me and more about him so this is a vivid demand Paul's calling for radical surgery he's saying that we must put to death every part of our being which is against God and I'm going to make a statement now make sure you hear this you may want to just write it down to remind yourself some parts that need to die in our lives die hard they're, they're not easy to kill they, they've, they've found the ground in your life they have a base of operation in your heart and they're, they're just hard to kill you don't want to just mortally wound these deeds of the flesh you must remove the head of the dragon decisively with resolute intent and determination it must be put to death. So the truth is that we can't perform this surgery ourselves. This is where the power of the Holy Spirit comes into play. The Christian life is no, do it yourself, make yourself right, lift yourself by your bootstraps religion. It is relationship of the heart in which all that we are is yielded to the transforming power of Jesus Christ. I mean, prostrate before Him. I mean humble before him, acknowledging, God, I can't overcome this. This deed in my flesh is getting the best of me. It's all I 
think about it. I'm consumed. I was reading the other day where one guy said that when he was drawn into the, the, uh, the sin of drug addiction, he said, even before I would take the drugs, I felt like I was drugged that led me into it. I, I think about some of my friends in recent days that have taken their life and some that we have talked to that we hoped we could talk them out of it, but they decided later to go against our counsel and took their own life. It seems as though they were no longer in control of their even thought process, but they were being drugged in. And, and that's what the enemy does. And so we need to put all of this to death, the Bible says. So the supreme reality for Paul was the union of the believer with the Lord Jesus. And this is a reality. It's a status of position, not fully worked out in our experience, in practice. I know who I am positionally. I know who I am in my status. But when it comes time to my practice and to my standing, oftentimes it is really a challenge. You know, it's, it does me well to read men that have gone before me, men I admired like Lloyd Ogilvy, uh, like Thomas Aquinas. Man, you're talking about going back years ago. Listen to what Lloyd Ogilvy said. Listen carefully to this statement. It, 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 it says in better vernacular what I want to say. Believers are like immigrants to a new country not yet completely habitated to its ways of life. But they had accepted citizenship in a new world and must learn to live in it. And so I've been birthed into the kingdom of God. But in this kingdom, I've got to learn to live. I've got to realize there's a real war waging for me. The enemy, uh, he'll wait on you. He, he'll, he'll ambush you and he'll just wait. If there's such, such thing as a patient devil that actually waits, and then you get in the very height of your years, the best of your ministry, the best that you've known in the kingdom of God, and right in the midst of that, he'll make his attack. Thomas Aquinas prayed this prayer. Give me, O Lord, a steadfast heart which no unworthy thought can drag downward, an unconquered heart which no tribulation can wear out, an upright heart which no unworthy purpose may tempt aside. It is this deliberate response to the revealed truth of God that makes the Christian life possible. It is this which makes our practice, listen to me, our practice conform to our position. Some people have got that confused. I know what I profess to be as a Christian, but I also know what I do in practice sometime as a Christian. And I, I just got a confession to make, maybe to help you with your confession. Sometimes my profession is not matched by my practice. I know how I'm to live. I know what pleases God. But there are sometimes the deeds of the flesh have the ruling arm because I don't yield and submit to the Spirit of God as I ought to. You see, it's not the effort of self to conform to creeds and codes and rituals that is ours in Christ. We respond to what God has done. God says the old man is dead, Johnny. And we say if God says so, it is so. So we reckon it to be true. But just because, listen to me, just because the old man is dead does not mean that the flesh is dead. The flesh is not dead. Uh, the habits are not dead. We're to be dead to sin, but sin is not dead. And it, continues to haunt I, I really believe that's part of the book of Romans chapter 8 where it seems like the whole creation and everything in humanity is calling out for the return of Christ that will bring the ultimate redemption so at last we can lay down these bodies of sin and be able to live in his presence where sin will dwell no longer. But until then, God has made provision. He really has. God has made provision that we can live above reproach. So we have to reckon true which God has said is true. We've got to appropriate the truth. And, and you know what I found? Look at me for a moment. When we appropriate the truth, God proves his truth to be true. That's how I know it's true. I, uh, I appropriate that truth in my life and I say, good night, look here. 
In other words, if you've got a stronghold in your life and you, you feel like every waking moment is trying to draw you in that way, you get to focus in on Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9. You begin to fast and seek God. You get into the Word. Get up that extra hour, whatever you've got to do. Lay yourself out before God and say, God, I can't, you can. Fill me with the Spirit of God. I totally yield myself to you. And I'm telling you what you'll find out. You'll find out that the truth that you appropriate proves to be true. God will prove to you that you can take him in his word. So the same Holy Spirit who reveals the truth objectively in the realm of Scripture lives within us to activate that truth subjectively in the realm of our body. So here's what you do. When you sit there with your Bible in your lap and your pen and you're making notes, you are learning objective truth. When you appropriate it into your daily walk, you are now living subjective truth. You're putting the truth of God's word to a test. And I'm telling you, he can be depended on. He can be trusted. Well, let me talk to you first of all in verse 7 about a past walk to be remembered. It's almost as though Paul is saying, now you know to some degree what it's like to be controlled by sin. Ephesians 2 talks about our life before Christ. In verse 1 it says, and you he made alive who were dead and trespassed in sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world. That's the way we used to walk. You once walked. Notice there's a contrast there. According to the prince of the power of the air, that is the devil was dictating, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves, all of us, every one of us, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. But God, here it is, here's where he saved us, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace are you saved through faith. It only stands to reason that if we were to have the capacity of forgetting the past, Paul would not have reminded us of it. The Colossians, like the Ephesians, had once walked living in sin unblushingly, but that was before they knew Christ. When the Bible says you once walked, there's a sharp distinction in the tenses. You used to live this way. Now, would you not agree that if we're going to make a difference in this world, it, be, it will be because we live different than we used to live. So the difference in action should characterize our life. And this serves as Paul's commendation and affirmed who they were in Christ. It well reminds us of the old life. He says we walked according to the course of this world. But what, what's the difference now? We now march to the beat of another world, not to the values and standards by this world, but the ones that have been set apart by God. He, he said you once walked according to the prince and the power there. That was people without Christ who are imprisoned with ideologies that are like fortresses, and they need to be set free and, and brought captive to Christ and to his word. Note verse 4 speaks of what we'd call a power encounter, divine interventions, divine interruptions. The glory of God has been manifested in his love and mercy for the sinner. And verse number 5 says you've been made alive. I'm afraid that there's so few Christians living the genuine Christian life that there's not a strong enough witness in the context of the average church for the person that's a backslider to believe that he really could be right with God again. Vance Hafner put it this way. He said, when you live the normal Christian life, most people think you're abnormal. And he said, so in order to fellowship with the average person in the church, you must live a subnormal life. Because if you live the normal Christian life, people begin to say, he, he thinks she's spiritual, or she thinks she's spiritual. They just might be. And you've forgotten what the real definition is. You know what Vance have to say? He said, you know what a fanatic for Jesus Christ really is? He said, a fanatic for Jesus Christ is someone who loves Jesus Christ more than you do. Spoke into my heart. Well, let me talk to you about a present witness to be resolved. Right, there's a past walk to be remembered. And I remember that any time I've been sucked in, it's never produced what I thought it would, would produce. But there's a past walk. You need to remember, and I, that's the way it used to be. And you used to, I, I wouldn't even care. I would have done that, and I wouldn't even care. But there's a present walk to be resolved now. 
and I want it to be gone. Anybody here just say, you know, look at me. If I never yield to another sin of the flesh, and you're not perfect, you will, but I pray you bounce back quick and a good man will fall seven times, but he'll get up. But is there anybody here that just says, you know, I am just so tired of being dominated by the deeds of the old man, the flesh. And what I want to do, I really do, Pastor Johnny, I want to take serious, and you don't even have time in here. You probably need to come in for counseling, see one of our ministers, or, or if you really know how to walk with God, you're going to have to find, get home and get in the closet. If you clear out some stuff, get in your closet, close the door behind you, and just lay out before the Lord and say, God, I can't do it, but I'm so serious. I want to spend the rest of my life doing the will of God. And I mean just be determined, resolute, that you, you really want to make it. And, and pray that God would so work in your life that people would start seeing more God. There'd be more God displayed instead of you. Not the hunt, but the Jesus that would be shown in your life. I don't know why I can't leave this subject alone. I've been dealing with it for four or five weeks, and I've got so much more that God is saying to me in my own life and see, and the reason I can relate this so well is I'm struggling right with you, but I'm just telling you I'm getting a good amount of victory. I really am, and I, I want to offer to you to say, I'm telling you, if you'll appropriate God's truth, he will prove the truth to be true in your life. So I don't want any of you to get so disheartened that your pornography, that your greed, that your anger, whatever, you name it, you put the word there, whatever it is, uh, the suicidal thoughts, they don't have to be there. I'm telling you, God can bring you and raise you above it through Jesus Christ. It's yours for the asking and for the claiming. But you may have to do like Proverbs 2. You may have to seek for it like you seek for silver and gold. Uh, diamonds. You don't, you don't find the diamond on the surface. You got you to dig. You got to mine for it. You got to get dirty. You got to get down. And, you, and what, you may say, well, I thought it was God doing it. It is, but you're cooperating with him. He does the work but you're cooperating. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you would work mightily in our lives. I love this body of Christ here. I love the Lord Jesus. I love the whole church as a whole in the world. But this flock that you've given me, and you told me to be diligent to know the flock. Father, in Jesus' name, give us more victorious Christians. Help us to desire to live the rest of our life for the will of God. For Jesus' sake, amen.